The Nintendo Switch isn't unlike a NASA spacecraft in that nearly every part of it has been specially designed to pull double or even triple duty. Its modular design means that it can function as a traditional home console, a portable system, and a standalone tablet with paired controllers. Getting a piece of hardware to do that much for $299.99 US would be an engineering miracle, and Nintendo has come close in some regards, but has fallen well short in others. The first thing that struck me about the Switch is the overall quality of its look and feel. The handsome matte finish of the two included Joy-Cons feels almost silken, begging to be touched. The console itself is almost alarmingly small and thin by home console standards, but its mostly metal and glass construction gives it a sturdy, substantial heft. Even small details like the way the Joy-Cons snap into place on the Joy-Con grip convey a premium feeling, the kind of gadget lust that has eluded Nintendo for generations now. The Switch's dock and the Joy-Con grip are little more than two simple pieces of plastic that allow this handheld to dress up like a home console. The dock itself is as bare bones as can be. It's essentially just a combination HDMI and USB pass-through charging station. The grip completes the Switch's console transformation, housing the left and right Joy-Con to form what feels like the most traditional controller Nintendo has made since the Super Nintendo. The smallish face buttons are sufficiently clicky and easy to hit, but the lack of a traditional D-pad or full-sized analog triggers will put it at a disadvantage for certain types of games. It's easy enough to adjust to these tiny quirks, but even once I did, the Joy-Con never felt quite like home the way a great controller should. Individually, each Joy-Con can be turned sideways to be used as a simple controller. But their tiny size and awkward layout has to be fought against even when playing the most basic of games, like Super Bomberman R. Also, they aren't symmetrical. One has buttons awkwardly pushed towards the center, while the other does the same to the analog stick instead, which means neither are in any way ideal to use. The Joy-Con controllers are packed with some nifty extra features that a creative developer might put to good use though. Their motion tracking accelerometers are highly accurate and responsive, which can be seen in games like 1-2 Switch. And the ball count minigame made me a believer in what Nintendo calls HD Rumble, a form of articulated haptic feedback that actually did a great job of fooling me into perceiving weight and motion within my Joy-Con. The right one even has an infrared sensor that could eventually be used in interesting ways, and an NFC reader for scanning amiibo, which is already being put to good use. Playing in console mode has had some reliability issues. I didn't have any problems when I played in handheld mode with the Joy-Cons docked directly to the tablet, but when disconnected and used with the included grip or individually, the left Joy-Con temporarily desyncs relatively often. Link died more than a few senseless deaths because I couldn't control him for a few seconds at a time, and I saw it happen several times when playing 1-2 Switch. Lots of the minigames require you to cover most of the Joy-Con with your hand, which interferes with its signal. I'm also concerned about what's under the hood. The Switch is powered by a custom version of Nvidia's Tegra X1 chipset, which is a powerhouse in the mobile world, but lacks the horsepower to meaningfully compete with the three-year-old PlayStation 4 or Xbox One. In fact, it's hard to judge just how much of an upgrade it is over the four-year-old Wii U based on specs alone. The Switch sports double the RAM, but in terms of GPU and CPU clock speed, the numbers are surprisingly close and not always in the Switch's favor. The Switch's premier launch game bears out this problem. In console mode, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild seldom makes it all the way to 30 frames per second at 900p, and it even dips far south of that when lots of particles or physics objects are on screen at once. That it suffers these issues despite a lack of anti-aliasing does not bode well for the system's long-term capabilities. Such performance issues would be somewhat understandable if Zelda was sporting gorgeous, high-resolution textures, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Even the massive, sprawling Breath of the Wild is crammed into a tiny 13.4 gig file, and on a big 1080p screen, it becomes fairly obvious that many of the textures have been heavily compressed. The art style hides it well in Zelda's case, but this may be a concern going forward with any potential multi-platform ports. However, these issues are soothed quite a bit by playing in handheld mode. The Switch's 6.2-inch 720p screen is a beauty. Colors are vibrant, and it's bright enough to be played in fairly direct sunlight. Its generous viewing angles are a huge boon too. 
Plus, since the Switch renders in 720p, frame rates were more consistent and I noticed the texture issues less on the smaller screen. This has become my preferred way to play. This is where the line between console and handheld begins to blur, and it's in this space where Nintendo's new platform shines the brightest. Since I can pick up the Switch and toss it in my backpack, or just take it into the next room, things like having to give up the TV or traveling to work no longer interrupt my gaming. The Switch transforms to meet both needs remarkably quickly, especially if you have a separately sold Pro Controller hooked up and ready to go so you can skip the steps of assembling or disassembling the Joy-Con grip. It only takes the Switch a few seconds to output an image on my TV after dropping the console into its dock. I've already had the grin-inducing experience of playing the same Zelda on the morning train as I was in my living room, and I can't imagine that will get old. I already get excited about PS4 games that are cross-buy and cross-save with the Vita, but Switch games all function that way by design, and not just for small-scale indie games either. At one point while playing Zelda in handheld mode in the living room, I randomly decided to detach the Joy-Con and stand the screen up on my coffee table to play snipper clips with my girlfriend. This is the real promise of the Switch's concept, and when the use case arises, it can be a truly compelling piece of hardware despite its problems. Where its power is perhaps questionable as a home console, the Switch is a monster by handheld gaming standards. It's on a whole different level compared to the Vita or the 3DS. Typically, power like this comes at a much higher price or can't be held comfortably in your hands. The Switch hits a sweet spot of power, affordability, and relative portability that few other mobile devices have yet managed, and the ones that do don't have Zelda on them. That balance is the system's most impressive feat. Even then though, there are compromises. If, like me, you arrive at the conclusion that handheld mode is the best experience, the rub is that a game like Zelda can only run for a couple of hours at a time unless you're within a few feet of a power outlet. And while it's light enough to play comfortably for extended periods, it's still too big to fit in all but the largest of pockets. So unless you typically leave the house with a backpack, a courier bag, or a nice sized handbag, it's not truly portable in the same way a 3DS or a Vita is. Though its hybrid capabilities are exciting, half of the Switch's functionality is still as a home console, and it suffers from several design inconveniences when it's used in that space. The most glaring is that there's no way to lay the system flat while docked, so it doesn't fit well into an entertainment center. This is particularly irritating given that the game card slot, headphone jack, headphone volume controls, and power button are all along the top of the system. Sadly, the Switch doesn't play nicely with other equipment. If you wanted to opt for some premium wireless headphones, you can't because there's no optical port. Nor is there an Ethernet port, so you're stuck with 802.11 AC Wi-Fi unless you buy the USB adapter. Quite possibly the largest of these issues is the woeful lack of onboard storage. With only 32 gigs on board, seven of which are used by the operating system, there's no way you'll be able to go all digital with your library unless you buy a hefty SD card. As for the UI, it's clean and snappy, but not in any way a standout. Being able to choose any profile in your system when you launch a game is a nice little convenience that makes it easy to share, but the lack of save data management options really hurts. All saves are infuriatingly bound to the hardware, with no way to transfer them physically or through Nintendo's bare bones online service. As of right now, there isn't any additional functionality in terms of video streaming or other services either. Granted, it can be easy to overlook this stuff when you're enjoying Zelda on your own personal screen in the car or in bed while someone else uses the TV, but all of these little omissions and issues make this Switch feel less than ideal no matter which way you use it. The Switch's chameleon-esque ability to cycle between being a home console, a handheld, and a mobile party game device helps it rise above its individual shortcomings, but only to an extent. On the go, it's a powerful piece of hardware with a gorgeous screen that's a little bit too large and power-hungry to feel completely portable. As a console, it's underpowered, unreliable, and lacking basic features and conveniences that all of its competitors offer. It's nicely built and cleverly designed to be used in a variety of ways, but the bottom line is that the Switch doesn't do any one of the many things it can do without some sort of significant compromise. For more on the Nintendo Switch, check out our Legend of Zelda combat montage, as well as our videos about how Breath of the Wild has bucked our expectations and the 10 new things we found while messing around with it.